you are qualified to be an elder in our church. You're just a kid. <laughs> well, maybe to you I'm a kid, Chris, but to others I'm probably not a kid. I love you, though. Thank you, Mike, for sending that. I have two disclaimers before I start today, and I wanted to share these with you before we got into the message. And the first disclaimer is, today there will be no new spiritual revelations in what I have to say. I'm going to have no new insights for you. My message today is going to be very simple, going to be totally unoriginal, and it's going to be a little different, much like enchiladas. <laughs> you know, you can get enchiladas in Kerrville, you can get enchiladas in San Antonio. You can go down to Brownsville and you can get enchiladas. You can go out to Tyler, Texas and get enchiladas. You can even go out to El Paso and get enchiladas. Sometimes enchiladas are filled with cheese or beef or chicken. Sometimes people put shrimp in enchiladas. Sometimes they make enchiladas with spinach. I don't recommend that personally, <laughs> but I know my wife likes that. You can make enchiladas so that they're flat and all stacked up. You can even go out to San, uh, what is it, uh, Los Angeles and have, uh, have uh, those things to eat. You can enjoy enchiladas just like you can anywhere else, but they're going to be a little different, and they're probably going to be unoriginal to you. So today's message is going to be a little simple, a little different, and totally unoriginal. My second disclaimer is this. Today's message will not be homiletically correct, it will not be hermeneutically astute, and it will not be theologically deep. So if none of those bother you, then you'll fit in just fine with what we have to say today. My diction and my speech will be far from perfect, but I promise you two things. I will tell you the truth, and this will be from my heart to your heart. Dr. Alex Montoya, who is a professor at the Master Seminary in California, had this to say about sermons. Every sermon is a, an effort to persuade the audience to obey biblical truth. And that's what we do week in and week out. Expository preaching to persuade requires many hours of study, preparation, and prayer. I can attest to that. Unfortunately, the average person remembers less than 10% of what's said from week to week. And this used to really bother me. I mean, I can't remember what I had for lunch on Friday. But there are things about the message that are interesting. And it bothered me to the point where I was just frustrated because I couldn't remember what Chris or Blair had preached on. And it, and it really bothered me until... I read something in the newspaper, our local newspaper, that a good friend of mine and a neighbor and pastor of Christ Church, John Standridge, wrote in the Kerrville Daily Times. And he wrote this about trying to remember everything about a sermon. And I thought it was really interesting. And I called him to ask him if I could use this for our congregation. He said, most definitely. And so this really did a lot for me. I don't know if you've come to those moments in your life where someone says something or you read something, you hear something, you said, now I get it, now I understand. Well, this particular article that he wrote did it for me. And this is what John wrote. And some of you may remember this. This happened a couple of months ago. So what do we do with this stubborn fact that so many leave church not being able to recount most of what they have just heard? I'm going to shock you. It seems to me that the sermon should not be thought of as content that you would be tested on later. Rather, it should be thought of as calories that feed your spiritual life. When I was living under my parents' roof, I estimate that I had over 18,000 meals at my table. In many ways, those meals made me who I am today. Not only did the food itself nourish my body as I grew... But being at the table with those people formed me into who I have grown up to be. Those meals were absolutely vital to who I was to become. But if you were to ask me if I remember what was on my plate night in and night out, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you. Well, maybe Meatloaf Monday. I threw that in. 
Aside from the occasional holiday meal, I don't really remember what we ate. But I was there being faithfully fed and loved, and that is what shaped me. The sermon is not simply content given for a personal spiritual growth, for spiritual, uh, but for spiritual growth for the people of God. Faithful pastors strive week in and week out to put a good square meal in front of their people. They do this with sensi sensitivity to their particular context, place, people, and time. We simply get off on the wrong foot when we look at it as content receiving individuals rather than God's inerrant word relished in community, unquote. So basically what John is saying is that consuming content provides calories for us. Consuming content will have a lasting impression on us. So please, feel free to consume all of the spiritual calories you can this morning. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is going to be our springboard verse, not our text verse, but our springboard verse for what I'd like to share with you this morning. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1. Written by God, of course, and his instrument was Solomon, possibly the wisest man that ever lived. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 1. And this is what is written. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. He's saying not just a time, but an appointed time. Not just some events, but every single event. That sounds to me like intelligent design. Someone is doing the appointing. Someone is causing every event at an appointed time. What kind of events is he causing? Well, if you read the next seven verses, you'll see just about everything that happens in your life and my life. It covers just about everything. We won't take time to read those, but I'm sure you've heard those before. So who is doing the appointing? Who is causing every event? Well, it's certainly not me. It's not Chris. It's not Governor Abbott, and it certainly isn't President Obama. Believe what you will, but there's too much evidence that the events in our lives don't just happen by chance. There's a design, and it's designed to work in our lives for his glory, not for ours. They are appointed by none other than our Heavenly Father, the Creator. So I conclude, based on that, that whether I have good events in my life or bad events in my life, I will rest in his plan for my life. I don't know if you're doing well today. I don't know if you're not doing very well today. But I do know this. Everything is going according to God's plan for your life and for my life. And I want you to know that as a Christian, this gives me a tremendous amount of peace knowing that there is my Heavenly Father directing every event at the timing that he has allowed it to happen in my life. That gives me a lot of peace. I don't have to worry about anything because he's in charge. Now the text today is from Ephesians chapter 2. And I would like to read for you the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the choice, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." If we ever hope to grow spiritually in this life, 
We have to understand these verses. These are foundational verses for our walk with Christ. The Bible says that we were dead. We were dead. Not physically dead, but spiritually dead. Prior to salvation, we had no way of understanding what was going on. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that we inherited death from Adam and Eve. Because of their disobedience, we were in Adam. Theologians call this the inherited sin. Much the same way we inherit physical traits from our parents. My dad was called red by my mother for all the years they were married. He passed away in 2003, and he had red hair. And I more than likely got my red hair from my father. Uh, He also died with a full head of hair. (laughs) I didn't get that characteristic. (laughs) But we inherit that from our parents. When Adam and Eve's relationship was shattered with God, ours was as well. You have to to understand, this this is basic Christian theology. You have to understand that we were born this way. It says in verse 3, we were by nature, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. Who are the rest? The rest of the world. We were like everybody else. We were not spiritually aware of what was going on. We were born spiritually dead. Physically alive, spiritually dead. We were just like everyone else. There was no distinction in our life compared to anyone else who was not born again. We were born in this way. It came naturally for us. We didn't have to learn to lie or to steal or to be self-centered or to be proud. It just came natural with us. Now, the operative word here is were. Were. I distinctly remember being a child of wrath. I remember those days. I don't like to think about it very often, but I know I was there at one time. 47 years ago, I was 21 years old. I was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. I was not looking for God prior to salvation. Let me be perfectly clear here. I never even considered God. He was not on my things to do list every day. I relentlessly sought my own pleasure. If it felt good, I did it. I was 21, on my own, living far from home, doing what I wanted to do, what I was doing naturally. I was behaving with the nature I was born with. I was not only in the world, but I was of the world. My nature prevented me from seeing and hearing the truth. I didn't know I was without hope. I did not know I was lost. There are a lot of people out there today just like that. Now, I want you to notice when we read these particular verses, there are three enemies that are explained to us that we have to deal with that have been against us ever since we've been here. The first one in verse 2 says, we walked according to the course of this world. In other words, we were under the influence of the world system. All you have to know about the world system is turn on your television, read a magazine. You can see what the world system is. The second enemy that we had was Satan. In verse 2, it says, we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. And I was walking just according to his desire for my life. Believe me. We were under the direction of Satan. Our third enemy, and personally probably the worst one, is the flesh. Verse 3, we lived our lives indulging the desires of the flesh. If it felt good, I did it. We were under the direction and the desires of the flesh that we lived in. Why couldn't we see this? Why not? Because we were spiritually dead unable to realize the situation we were in. Notice Paul uses the words, you formerly walked. And we too all formerly lived. The you are the Christian Gentile saints and us today. The we too are Paul and the Christian Jews. You see, all Christian Jews and all Christian Gentiles have this in common. We were. We were lost with no hope. By the way, I just throw this in for free. We are not all God's children. 
We're not all children of God. Not every person that lives on the earth is a child of God. We're not born a Christian. We don't just, because we're born into a home with a mom and dad who know Christ, we automatically become Christians. No. Let me read you a verse from uh, chapter uh, 8 of John. Let me, t- let me show you what Jesus says about children and whose children we are. In John chapter 8, in, uh, starting in verse 42, Jesus said to them, he's talking to the Pharisees now, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? And he answers his own question. It is because you cannot hear my word. You see, they were spiritually dead. You are of your father, the devil. In other words, they weren't God's children. They were the devil's children. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So you see, we're not all children of God. The only children of God are those who have a new heart that God redeemed. That's it. That's who we were. That's who we were. I'm not that person anymore. That person died in January of 1970, 46 and a half years ago. Galatians 2.20 says it best for me. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By the way, uh, unlike uh, prior to salvation, we now have the whole armor of God, do we not? We have the shield of faith. We have the sword of the Spirit. We have much more now. Now let's look at verses 4 through 7 of Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I want you, I want you to notice those two words, but God, but God. God provides the world's greatest rescue mission ever. Against the backdrop of our total helplessness, we have but God. My two favorite Bible words in the entire Bible are these two words, but God. What was impossible for you and for me, God made possible. This is why we praise and honor Him every day of our lives as Christians. I want to tell you about a long-time friend of mine Uh, Back in the 70s, I was uh, principal of a Christian school. And because I was uh, uh, principal of a a Christian school, our our school was sponsored by uh, a Baptist church. And because of that, I was also the education director in our church. And and in our services, the pastor and the associate pastor sat up on the platform. And then the music director and the education director sat on the other side. And the man sitting next to me, who was our music director, was uh, affectionately known as Brother Slick, for obvious reasons. Brother Slick. (laughs) Love the man. He's He's gone home to be with the Lord now, but he was a wonderful man, and there were characteristics about him that I truly admired. I remember one time we were at a men's conference, and there were probably 4,000 men at this conference, and Toward the end, we sang, How Great Thou Art. It was amazing to hear that many men sing How Great Thou Art. I mean, it was truly inspiring, truly uplifting. And I'm standing next to Brother Slick, and all of a sudden, he starts kind of moving around like this, and instead of singing, he was breathing kind of... And I thought, what is wrong with him? And then as we finished the song, 
as, the, as it's so quiet at the very end, he lets out with this loud, he couldn't hold it anymore. He just had to shout and give God the praise. Everybody laughed. It was, it was really kind of funny. and it was, it was kind of scary, actually. I was standing right next to him. What is wrong? Well, that same thing happened that day we were reading this particular scripture. Our pastor was preaching on Ephesians chapter 2, and I started to get that feeling. I was looking over him. He was starting to kind of move up and around like this, and he turned a little red, and, and then he started, and I knew something was getting ready to happen. And when he talked, when, when our pastor talked about but God, he flew up out of his chair and, and walked and He said, I can't hold it in anymore. I can't hold it in anymore. I just got to praise the Lord. Now, this is a Baptist church, you understand. <laughs> this, is not a, this is not a Pentecostal church or anything, but this man, and I loved him so much. He was so loved. But he was a man who experienced God's grace, and he understood what but, but God meant. Why did God do this for us? Well, it gives us the answers. If you look at, if you read these verses, you can see the answers as to why would God do this for us. He says in verse 4 that God is rich in mercy. Why? Because God's nature is to be merciful, is it not? Also in verse 4, it says, of His great love for us. God's nature is to love because God is love. And then in verse 7, he says, the third reason is because of his grace and kindness towards us. Because God demonstrates his grace and kindness to us. And I would add, there's probably another reason as well. Because nobody else could. There was no one else there to do that. Buddha sure can't do it. Mohammed is never going to be able to do it. And I know darn good and well the Pope is never going to be able to do it. Only Christ could do this for us. Look at verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. How did God do it? What avenue did he take to make this transformation in our lives? The Bible says it was done through faith, by faith, not faith plus good works. Faith alone, through Christ alone. It is all from the grace of God. He did not most of it, not some of it, not occasionally thinking about it. He did all of it. He did everything. We need to get a grasp on that. Our good works have nothing to do with salvation. Do not be confused about this. My mother, who, as some of you know, recently passed in July, and I spent quite a bit of time with her alone in the hospital. I, I talked to her about the Lord. I talked about her, her relationship to the Lord. And although she had been to church many times in her life, and she knew this, she knew this, she was still at her age of 87, and hearing us talk about this from time and time again, she still thought, well, I just hope I'm good enough. Mom, it doesn't have anything to do with how good you are. And it just really bothers me that so many people are confused about this, that we can't earn our way into heaven. We cannot be good enough. Our good works have nothing to do with salvation. We are justified before God through faith, not our good works. However, however, good works have everything to do with how we live, our lifestyle. You might say good works are the byproduct of salvation. I would add good works happen naturally after salvation. It's a natural outcome of our relationship with Christ. By the way, within these 10 verses is a simple six-word formula for sharing your faith. I know sometimes it's scary when someone asks about your faith and why you believe what you believe and what you want to share with them, and maybe you don't know where to go in the Bible, and you don't know the Romans road to salvation and all of that, but I can tell you, if you'll go to Ephesians chapter 2, and just think about these six words, 
it will help you to demonstrate to them and share with them the truth of the gospel because this is the gospel of Christ. You'll notice in verse 1 it says, you were. What that does is it reveals our spiritual condition. That's where we were. Ken, we were dead. We were dead. And then number 4, in verse 4, it says, but God which reveals what God did in our spiritual condition. So we were dead, but God reveals what he did for our spiritual condition. And then finally in verse 8, through faith, which reveals the method that God used to change our spiritual condition. So you see, you can use this to share your faith with other people that don't understand. This is the gospel. Now, people who take scripture out of context think there is a problem here. If good works are needed for salvation, why does James say faith without works is dead? Is there a conflict between what Paul the Apostle is saying and James is saying? Turn over, if you will, to James chapter 2. That's right after Hebrews, I think, unless it's moved. It's in there somewhere. One time... Chris got up and he, was, he said, turn in your Bibles to some, some book in the Bible. And for, for whatever reason, for the life of me, I thought, where is that? And I was, I'm thinking, man, I went to Bible college. I was, a, I, was a, I was principal of a Christian school. I've been a Christian forever. I can't think, where is that book in the Bible? So embarrassingly, I had to go to the front of the Bible and look and find out where it was. Oh, yeah, that's where it was. I don't remember what the book was, but... I do remember that experience. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, this is what James says. And so many people take this out of context. James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works." There's no difference. They're saying the exact same thing. Paul was attacking the Pharisaic idea that our good works will commend us to God. That's not what, that's not what Paul is... He's not saying our good works determine our salvation. It doesn't commend us to God. He argues that no one can ever be good enough to earn salvation. I would suggest to you, if you think that being good enough can earn your way to heaven, then I would say that then that means that you can be bad enough to lose it. If you can be good enough to get it, then can't you be bad enough to earn to lose it? God justifies guilty sinners through faith in Christ alone. God has ordained the entire event. There is no self-glory in our salvation or our good works. It's all of God. We need to really nail this because this is the basis for everything that we believe. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith. God has ordained every entire event, this entire event. Now James, on the other hand, What was he doing? He was attacking the view that saving faith does not necessarily result in good works. Well, of course it does. That's a natural outcome of salvation. We want to do good works because we're we're saved. While salvation is entirely of God, so are the good works that follow salvation. James shows that genuine faith always always produces good works. Charles Spurgeon once said this about good works and faith. We have been clear upon the fact that good works are not the course, cause, I'm sorry, are not the cause of salvation. Let us be equally clear upon the truth that they are the necessary fruit of it. The fruit of salvation is good works. 
Salvation is not performed by doing good works. I've heard this all my life. All my Christian life, I've heard this. For the last 46 years. And you know what? It never gets old. (laughs) The gospel just doesn't grow old. To put it another way, we are not saved by our good works. We are saved for our good works. Notice the two prepositions, big difference. By our good works and for good works. God works are the natural response to salvation, are they not? Good works are the evidence of salvation, not the cause of it. God, as I've said before, did everything. Why? Why would God want to do everything? Why doesn't he let us do something? I mean, my nature wants to do something for God. I want to show God that I'm worthy of his love and affection. I want to be faithful in church, so I want to sing in the choir. I want to teach Sunday school. I want to do all those great things to help other people because I want to be saved. That's not why we do that. We do that. We're already saved, you see. That's just an evidence of our salvation. Good works are the evidence of salvation, not the cause of it. So the reason why God has done it all is because he doesn't want anybody to boast about what they did to earn it. That's what the Bible says right here. It says, so that no one may boast. Our nature wants to get some glory, though, doesn't it? It's like the guy that, comes and visits a church and he's very wealthy and everything and he wants to feel good about himself so you know when the offering plate comes around he doesn't take that hundred dollar bill out of his wallet and and fold it up real small and and put it in the offering plate oh no he opens that thing up real wide and lays it out there kind of lingers with it he wants everybody to see how much money he gave you see why the difference that's the difference Our nature wants to get some glory, but God has ordained the entire event. There's no self-glory in our salvation or our good works. It's all of God. So does this mean that once God saves us, we are free of sin? Do, this this is a rhetorical question, do genuine believers sin? I mean to tell you. I'm still living in this flesh. I still have struggles with that. You know what the difference is, though, between a Christian and a non-Christian as far as sin is concerned? A Christian has a deep hatred for sin, a repulsiveness to do it. And when a Christian sins, that desire is there to fight against it. Doesn't mean they'll always win. Doesn't mean we will always win against sin. But it does mean that we hate that. And we hate that we have done that. I say things sometimes that I can't believe that came out of my mouth. I can't believe I was so sarcastic or so judgmental or so critical of other people. I can't believe that. And I have to repent and say, yeah, I'm still in this body. I'm still dealing with that sin. And I hate it. I hate it when I do that. And I, 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 t- I wish I could take those words back. We deal with that every day. So the natural result of an, of the, the natural re result and evidence of salvation is the demonstration of our walk with Christ. You see, walking is a metaphor for lifestyle, how we live day in and day out. Ephesians 4.1 tells us, I implore you to, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of of the calling with which you have been called. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, the Bible says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. In Ephesians 5, 15, the Bible says, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. God doesn't save us so we can live to ourselves. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's all about Him. God doesn't save us so we can do our own thing either. The purpose of our our salvation is Christ-likeness. I would persuade you today not to be content with just having a ticket to heaven. There's a lot more to being a Christian than showing up on Sunday morning. 
There's a lot more to it. I would persuade you today to think about that. Don't be satisfied with just that. Take what God has given you and let it change your life forever. Forever. And he will do that. He will give you a new desire for things that you perhaps never had a desire to do. Let him change you. Let him mold you. Look at verse 10 in closing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And he sums it up this way. For we are his workmanship. Whose workmanship? His workmanship. Not our workmanship, but we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Do you see it? God sovereignly prepared good works for each one of us before time began. We are responsible to him to walk in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for the truth of salvation, for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ who teaches us that salvation is entirely because of your mercy and your grace and your love. Nothing that we've done or deserve uh, has anything to do with salvation. And yet, Lord, we know that after our relationship with you has begun, that we have a natural inclination to do those things that bring honor to your name, that our life would be filled with works the things that we say and do would be good and that they would be a blessing to others. Help us to be a blessing one to another. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Thank you for this time this week and I pray that you will receive all the glory and honor that's due you in Jesus' name. Amen.